Hi folks, and welcome to the Mean for Money podcast. This is session number 408. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we are once again, still got the stupid lockdown here. So just look at my monitor, it's really not good. Hopefully being fixed today, I'm letting my uh, 17 year old daughter Kate loose on my head with clippers. So uh, next week should be interesting if you tune in then just to see what the result was. <laughs> we'll see. But it's a joy this week to welcome back longtime friend of the show and friend of mine, Justin Urquhart Stewart, to the podcast. He's here to talk about the outlook uh, of the world economy coming off the back of COVID and also, more importantly, I think, his latest venture called Regionally, which is something that he's really excited about and I think he's going to be a fascinating uh, entrant, in fact, a disruptor, really, into how investing is done on a regional basis. So I uh, look forward to hearing more about that. As usual, after the main body of the show, I'll look at the recent review that's been left and that's what we're going to be talking about next week. But before any of that, as ever, the podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management, who've been helping me out here for ages since the spring of 2011. Uh, do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Uh, check them out and say thank you to them from me. Now, Justin Urquhart Stewart is something of a personal finance industry legend, arguably one of the most visible people when it comes to market commentary. He spent years, you know, going on the news, BBC, Sky, Al Jazeera, all kinds of places, talking about what's going on in the world markets. So he's a co-founder of my longtime sponsors, 7IM, retired from there now, largely, but never want to sit still and just retire quietly. He's now involved with a new venture called Regionally, uh, which is a practical solution to a problem which I know that Justin has been passionate about for some time. So enjoy my conversation with Justin. The man's a genius and a good friend. Remember, notes, links from today's show, they're at the show notes, which is the only link you need to remember, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session408, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session408. Here's my conversation with the man, the legend, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Well, this is a real uh, treat. It's been a little while since I've had my good friend Justin Urquhart Stewart on the podcast. He's back uh, to tell us about a new venture of his and also, as ever, just a bit of a discussion about what's going on in the world. Justin, how are you doing, sir? Great to have you back. Pete, thank you very much indeed. A great pleasure to be back. And I'm fine. Um, I'm in, in very good heart, he says day by day thinking until we actually get the vaccine but fingers crossed so far yes yeah, sure you're still way too young to have got the vaccine as we record this of course uh, as am i but just uh give us a bit of an update because it has been it has been a while so um you know there's been some sort of changes work-wise for you and all sorts going on so you're happy to just well yes to speed? uh when tom and i set up uh seven investment management uh, to, about 21 22 20 years ago and when we set it up we did actually put a clause in there saying that when you get to 65 the old farts should retire <laughs> and get out of the way and the only trouble was i then suddenly realized i was 65 um <laughs> and uh so we had already made sure we had found someone to take the business on uh, with the right ethic and attitude that we had, which was Caledonia, which was delighted to have them. Um, but it also then meant quite rightly, uh, Tom and I should step back. He stepped back and uh, so did I. Uh, and I wanted to follow something which I, I has always been something I bored you with uh, for years about is how do we get more investment into the regions of Britain? Um, and not have the domination of London, um, and not go about setting up regional stock exchanges and things like that, but have a mechanism whereby regional people in the regions can inv invest in their own businesses, or come to that in any other region's businesses, um, and actually create uh, access to more capital. So it's not a matter of having an advisory firm or investment firm, it's actually financial plumbing, yeah. just trying to put that plumbing back, um, because there used to be, and in fact, there was, of course, uh, in Cornwall, in 1945, there were 45 stock exchanges in Britain. And it, on the train, which, of course, one has a long time on the train going to Cornwall to look out of the window, just as one comes across, um, I think it's actually coming in towards Camborne, there is a sign on the side of a shed. At least I hope it's the shed and not the actual building itself, <laughs> which actually does say the Cornish Stock Exchange. Right. Um, because I've never seen one. that. It's a bit worrying, isn't yeah. it? I've never noticed well, the shed, that. I should do. Well, the shed may have fallen down in the meantime. <laughs> uh, but the point was, there was a stock exchange there, and quite rightly, based around, mildly surprising, mining. Mm. 
And uh, but the point was, people in Cornwall were investing in Cornish businesses. Okay. Um, and not only that, people outside Cornwall were investing in Corn- Cornish businesses. And if they wanted to do it now, they couldn't. <laughs> there isn't a mechanism of doing so. Um, unless you have to know someone privately uh, who might be able to want some money. So that was the idea, to try and actually see if we could set this up, um, to see if there was the groundswell. Don't want any government money and things like that. But to see if there's a reason why in each region, why that region would say, yes, we want to try and do that. Then we can actually give them the platform, the structure to enable them to get on with it. And I can step back and provide whatever support is necessary. Fantastic. Well, I tell you what, we'll pick up that in a bit because I'm uh, super interested in this. I think it's uh, a really interesting idea and I know if anybody will make it work, you will. But it's uh, we'll come back to that. I just wonder, I can't have you on the podcast without picking your brains about your view on the world, the world markets, the world economies and things like that. So I just wondered how you, you know, over the last year or so, as we've watched the whole thing unfold, what your views have been, how particularly I'd be interested to know how um, uh, you think the central banks and the governments have coped with it. I apologise to the Burmese cat wandering past so so often they have an interest in it. (laughs) It's been fascinating um, because you think last year, uh, did you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse turn up? (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, maybe slightly over dramatic, but I don't know. You, you had a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Trump. Um, we had. Uh, I think he definitely qualifies as that. Um, and then we also had, of course, uh, a series of economic coronaries around the world. Mm. Um, and then, of course, you had all the geopolitical issues, which sometimes get pushed into the background. So whether you're dealing with anything in the Middle East or or any other elements like that, or tensions around some of the Chinese borders. So all those elements. Now here we are going into. Uh, 21. And we have a new president. Um, and you know, so we've got Rod Trump. So we now have Sleepy Joe. But for heaven's sake, I don't care if he's asleep. It's, it's an improvement yeah. on the last one. Yeah. Um, and so that's going to be good. And we've already seen some changes coming through. And that, that'll that help. That vital word we've always talked about in the economy of confidence, mm. uh, international confidence. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, we've got the vaccines. And so fingers crossed, they will have an effect. No, the COVID will carry on evolving and being unpleasant for donkey's years to come. We're not going to get rid of it. We're going to learn to live with it. But that's fine. And then the global economy itself, well, actually, despite what everyone's saying, the global economy is going to grow this year. Well, primarily based on the growth coming out of China, actually. Um, right. But nonetheless, there's still growth coming, uh, uh, coming through. China is a, a different issue. I've actually been writing about that recently, about not so much what's wrong with China. How do we manage China? Mm. Um, you don't lie down and let them walk all over you. Uh, but equally, you don't shout at them uh, like uh, Trump did, uh, rather stupidly. But that's another issue. Growth will come back. Growth will be there in the States. Why? Because there's going to be a huge, great package which will make sure the American economy gets going again. Um, and again, subject to vaccines and all that sort of stuff. But Biden, the Biden's got the, the right idea. Get the vaccines, get the, the pandemic sorted out, uh, at least un- man- management, um, and then you can start opening up the economy properly. Um, the same will happen in Europe. The same will happen in the United Kingdom. Um, and as to the geopolitical issues, again, We've had Biden uh, and also China already putting hands out to each other to say, let's actually sit down and discuss things in a more uh, grown up way. Um, uh, We still have other issues around the world to to, to try and manage, but we've also got issues like the Paris Accord they're going back into. So all of those elements mean the four things that were really frightening last year. Uh, have changed. Uh, there are still some very frightening things out there. An awful lot can go wrong. Mm. Um, but from the people who are sitting there wringing their hands saying that we're all doomed, um, I think you can actually sit there and say damaged, but not doomed. Yeah, which is, which is encouraging. Brexit, one of those factors? Or is that really uh, a bit of a sideshow well, in the grand scheme of things? And of course, uh, the British have to add some other little <laughs> element to that as well. Uh, the fiasco, which is Brexit. And I appreciate um, uh, those uh, true Cornishmen voted to leave, which was a shame in my view. Um, but <laughs> yes. nonetheless, I did not, for um, the record. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, we are where we are, yeah. um, and uh, it's uh, it, it, we're going to have to work our way through it, and it's going to be a bit of a pig's ear. We just added an extra dimension of complication for us. Perversely, we could actually try and use it to our benefit, even though it is in a strange situation, because the, you know, the EU is going to go through some significant problems over the next few years, as it adjusts um, its political structure um, and its economic structure with a currency which has got some fundamental flaws to it, the euro, 
Um, and uh, so, uh, in many ways, actually, Britain could be a benefit to some of those northern nations who will find themselves increasingly difficult to operate within the euro in its current form. Um, but that's a long way ahead. Sure. Uh, so we've got to make the best of it. We've got to try and make sure that we are uh, a highly efficient uh, economy. Not Britain, not those seem to be wildly efficient. <laughs> but focus on the bits we're really good at. Mm. And we know the bits we're good at, um, and it's not making cars and things like that, or sort of assembling cars or those bits and pieces. That's you know, very nice to have, but beside the point. No, no, the bits we're good at, well, the service sector, the financial services sector, which, of course, has been completely ignored by the government. Um, no, uh, with all due deference to excellent Cornish fishermen, uh, thank you very much, chaps, for the, for, the, for the fish. But economically, I'm afraid you ain't that important. No. Exactly. Uh, particularly when it comes to not just financial services and silly gits and red braces, and I'm sorry I'm not wearing any today, um, <laughs> but um, actually for the tax income for the government, which is actually much more important. Yeah, of course. But the other issue, of course, that we're, we're really good at, which is the future, and that, of course, is technology. And where we have been really good at technology, and you can see the uh, from the, that, the, that nomenclature of uh, you know, like Silicon Valley. Well, of course, we have sort of Silicon Hub, uh, Silicon Roundabout. We have Silicon Beach, Silicon Gorge, and that's Bristol. Um, Silicon Fen, Silicon Glen. Um, and I'm sure there's a Silicon Pasty somewhere. Um, and uh, But what it is, of course, it's actually nurturing those hubs. And we know from those, once you get those hubs developing, they breed, um, and they breed, you know, good technology, good businesses spinning out. But then you come across the problem. Where do they grow? And it's interesting, the government's got a, a review at the moment under Lord Hill looking at why very few companies list in Britain, to which I would argue, because we don't have a proper stock exchange anymore. We have a stock exchange that looks after very large corporations. So if you happen to be a Ramco or something like that, or some of that other large uh, multinational, London's to you, mate, in, uh, if they can persuade you to go there. If you're a small company wishing to grow and you want sort of low-cost capital you could have easy access to, now, AIM, which I admit I was a part of right at the beginning, up in Glasgow 35 years ago, was a low-cost, simple mechanism of raising capital. It's now a rather expensive uh, mechanism, not very well run. Frankly, its only benefit is if it died um, in terms of inheritance tax. Sorry, I'm being a bit cruel. Um, but nonetheless, it's not fit for purpose. And so there's a bit of our plumbing missing here. How do we get smaller businesses to become growth businesses, to get to large businesses. So we've got large ones, we've got smaller ones, startups. We're still very good at startups. Mm -hmm. It's the bit in the middle that we're not so good at. Um, and that's where I want to see government uh, initiatives there. And that's not government money. That's not uh, government handouts uh, you know, end up becoming a government opioid. That's not the yeah. issue. It's creating the mechanism of getting more money going into. So being imaginative over things like capital gains tax, now they, they talked about changing capital gains tax to make it more punitive. Mm -hmm. Well, I would reverse that process Absolutely. and actually say, no, no, make it creative so it's longer term for investors to say, actually, if you're investing for five to ten years, not three years, not private equity, no venture capital, but five, seven, ten years, that's what we have, the outlook we want to have, an outlook which would be very typical that you'd find certainly on the continent, and that's what we've got to start thinking of here. Do we need to worry... Given the amount of response, you mentioned sort of uh, Biden needing to sort of kickstart the economy, and that's the plan to do that massive injection of capital and stuff. Do we need to worry about that? It's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, you know, have we printed too much money? I say we. I mean, you know, sort of the, the the big economies, the big central banks. Have we printed too much money? Are we storing up problems for ourselves going forward? Now, potentially we are, is the answer. Um, we can all smile and say, no, it's fine, we can keep on doing this. We're a reserve currency, we can print more and more and more. And in theory, you can, because it's a fiat currency. And a fiat currency is based on confidence that someone's going to back that paper up, or plastic. Um, and so, therefore, uh, whilst everyone's willing to go along with that, and we're uh, absolutely sure the emperor's clothes are looking absolutely spectacular, it's fine. But there comes a stage, and the Japanese are closer to it than we are, where the Japanese don't have a bond market anymore. Well, they do, except it's owned by the government. Um, and Japanese large corporations have got big shareholders known as the government. And you've got the you know, Japanese government buying other assets. So, so much for free capitalism when it's mm -hmm. run by the government. Um, so you're taking that to an extreme, and we're heading down that route. Then there comes a tipping point. When people say, "Hang on a second, hang on, this is a, this is a this is a trick here. You are just printing money." The fact you're saying, "I've got an independent Bank of England, which isn't um, actually just buying the debt we're producing, and it's just going around in circles." And you look at the amount of interest we're now paying. 
uh, on our debts to ourselves. And, you know, and you suddenly think, hang on, this doesn't make sense. Mm. But before, whilst being so cynical about it, it's fine for the moment. And so long as everyone is willing to go along with this fairy tale, um, and uh, we're in a position that uh, we can carry on doing it. How do you get out of it? Well, you can get out of it with inflation, but you don't really want to go down that route. But actually what you do is you have the great benefits of, uh, uh, of uh, the accounting systems um, effectively being able to take two sides of the balance sheet and crossing the noughts off. Because if I owe that much to this person, and this person has to be the same person as that person, funny enough, you can cross them off. Mm-hmm. But you've got to do it quite carefully. <laughs> Um, otherwise, you're seen as actually just being uh, running running loose with your own, own debt and finance. So, uh, gently, you cancel the debt over the years, and you do that over a period of time. And you have to take a longer term view on this. And Janet Yellen, in her uh, in her uh, uh, no, uh, interviews at the, with the Senate at the moment, um, is trying to put this plan forward to try and get them to think longer term. Um, but when you're up against populist politicians, it's always quite difficult. All populist, uh, politicians seem to be populist yeah. at the minute, aren't they? But, yeah, that's uh, true. Do you, there's been quite a marked difference across around the world as to how different markets have responded. So the American market, for example, seemed almost to shake off the stock markets, particularly not the economy. Obviously, they're related mm. but different, whereas the UK uh, stock market is still lagging. You've got some insights into why that's the case? Yes, I mean, you. first of all, we look at the FTSE 100, and, and uh, you and as many of your uh, 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 viewers will know, the FTSE 100 isn't a UK index, it's a global index. 65% of its turnover is actually overseas. Uh, some of those companies may, won't have come across the United Kingdom at all. And some, of course, will have come to the FTSE 100 and will come to the UK because they wouldn't get qualification to actually float on the New York markets, so particularly some of those Central European, um, Central Asian mining companies and things like that. Um, so it's a very international one. So what you had was a, um, an index dominated by finance, dominated by uh, minings uh, and uh, oil companies. And those are the areas that didn't move. So last year, what you saw in America initially was a very narrow movement based around well, um, the, the small number of technology stocks, you know, Alphabet and, uh, and uh, Amazon and the others, um, and they pushed it all through because they were benefiting from this hugely, and of course still are. Mm. We saw that spread out as people tried to find other uh, benefits, and there was a little bit more confidence that actually the economy would start picking up again, money was finding other places to go. And it was beginning to just look at it and say, well, where else do we go? Um, because we're running out of alternatives. Yes, you can go into gold, and you saw even enthusiasm towards Bitcoin, spare us. Um, but that's what's going to be happening. People will be looking for spurious schemes they can come across, and all to the warning, therefore, for all uh, investors, be wary of snake oil salesmen. Mm. They're awfully nice and very pleasant and very dangerous. Um, and... Uh, so that's what you see now is the UK beginning to see a sort of sign of catch up with that. And as the global economy, we hope, picks up this year and there's a broader demand for commodities, oils and things like that, the FTSE 100 will come back up. But even so, after with what happened with FTSE last year, remember, they were still, despite heavy cuts in dividends, you were still getting a reasonable yield off it, um, which still surprised me. It stayed up that high. I thought it would have gone down to a much lower level. It was still getting 3%. Um, so in a world where you're getting zero on your on your deposit account, um, I'm not suggesting everyone rushes into the FTSE 100, but for longer-term investors on a broader scale, there's still a return there, despite the four horsemen that were there last year. Um, it's quite amazing, that actually, that's come through. Do we need to worry about the dominance of the technology companies? Are they too big? Yes, I remember, I think we, we discussed this a few years back. It's one of the things that the uh, Americans have always done in the past. When you get companies being too big for their boots, they take their boots away. Um, and we saw that with the railway companies, and with steel companies, telecom companies, um, all, all sorts of issues. When they, when they start becoming monopolistic, uh, not so much in their ownership, but in their behavior, um, then the Americans have their antitrust rules, antitrust legislation, and they will take action against it. And you can see this welling up with uh, Facebook and the others. Um, not so much about necessarily cancelling people's Facebook accounts and, um, uh, and Twitter accounts and all those sort of things, um, but more to the point, uh, actually how much control do these businesses have? And some are like Amazon being absolutely dominant when it comes to uh, you know, domestic uh, trade and everyone has probably been using Amazon um, because where else do you go to? Mm. They may think, well, maybe we can go to Argos, but that tends to be a second thought. Yeah. Um, but globally, it has been ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, and so governments will find a way of taxing them, changing them, and don't be at all surprised that uh, under Biden, I wouldn't be at all surprised, we do actually see some antitrust legislation mm. uh, coming in to break up their power in some form. Interesting. 
thank you for that. You mentioned, let's sort of segue a little bit and, and, and talk about regionally now your sort of your new venture. So you mentioned about the Cornish stock market earlier on, but can you just just give us a bit of a, a history? I mean, how investing actually works. Most of us don't understand how money flows, but obviously it's got roots going back centuries. Can you just give us a so brief history lesson? Brief history lesson. Okay, we can all go back to the South Sea bubble if we so wish, but it's always worth remembering some of those horrors and, and the Dutch tulip bulb scandals. Basically, the whole concept of investment is actually to ask someone to part with their money to invest in a scheme by which they'll get a hopefully a better, a better return in due course, a return of their money, hopefully more of a return and maybe even an income. And so how is that done? Um, well, traditionally, if you went around the United Kingdom, you'd find that was done on a very localised basis. Um, particularly if you take someone like Falmouth, you took someone like Exeter, uh, you had the trading ports there, business, the steam packets would be coming in, people would know what, what would be coming in, and we'd be trading those goods um, in advance on them coming in, tra- creating a form of futures market. This was seen as a much bigger scale in London where you can still see the old coffee shops where they were, where various commodities were traded um, as the boats were were coming up the Thames. But that's London. It happened elsewhere around the country. Most obviously it happened in Bristol, which obviously has a slightly darker past to it as well, its connection to the slave trade. Mm. But that was uh, uh, affected many other areas too. But it's like Cornwall. There you also had the opportunity of people saying, actually, we need more money for investment, obviously in mines, but, uh, but in other areas as well. So putting out a prospectus, very simple prospectus, just to say, look, actually, this is our business idea. This is what we want to do. Will the good burgers, please, of Cornwall, be interested in putting up their, their money to do so? And I remember just seeing some history back in the, the stock exchange of, uh, in Glasgow, which is the last regional stock exchange to go back in 94. Um, and then uh, what we found, there was lovely things like the Gorbals Gravitational Water Company, I'm not too sure I'd wish to drink much water coming from the Gorbals, but uh, <laughs> someone decided it was a good idea. Um, and uh, it was quite literally £5,000 raised locally to be able to actually do that. Um, and they did so. It actually made money. I bet you became part of Scottish water. Um, and it was a simple mechanism. And so the whole concept was you could do that on a regional basis. And the stock exchanges were there. But sadly, they were run by silly gits and red braces like me, um, many of whom were sort of greedy stockbrokers interested in trading commissions. How do I buy and sell stuff? And every time you buy and sell stuff, I'll learn something. Well, that's not what the purpose of a stock exchange is. The primary purpose of a stock exchange is to raise capital for business. If you can't do that, go away. I would argue, therefore, that London doesn't actually qualify as a London Stock Exchange, doesn't qualify as a stock exchange anymore, because it's forgotten to do that. Such uh, flotations as it has tends to be for large international corporations. And AIM, as I mentioned before, is not the beast it was. Um, And it was supposed to be a simple, low-cost mechanism for actually raising money in Glasgow for actually software. uh, In those days, it was actually uh, software games companies. Relatively small amounts, raised it very simply. But when London found itself shutting down exchange, found it was stuck with this animal, didn't know what to do with it, took it down to London, changed its name, um, added a load of costs and elements to it, um, and it is what it is, which is now, frankly, a, a bugger's muddle. <laughs> so going back to therefore, there is a gap. We still need to raise money in Cornwall or throughout the country for growing businesses. There are lots of very good growing businesses. Not so much startups, there are lots of good startup ideas coming through. But where do I get to the next stage? It's not the bank's job. That's not their job. Banks are there to buy cash flow. Not always very good at that. Um, So you should find other ways. And it's not done locally because what happens, the corporate advisor in Exeter or wherever it happens to be will say, have helped nurture this business through. Uh, Well, you now have to raise more money. Where do we go? Oh, we'll have to go to London. So you have to go to a corporate advisor in London with the costs coming from that. And everything is that much more expensive. Um, Why couldn't it be done locally through that corporate advisor? Because there wasn't a mechanism to do so. And now, of course, we have a mechanism. We've got more platforms in this country than network rail. Um, <laughs> so you don't need another platform. What you need is just use one of those, adjust that necessarily, and have a mechanism so that you could create a, a list of companies in due course that wish to raise money or are raising money or even have raised money in Cornwall or the Southwest. Um, and there effectively is becomes the uh, effectively the West Country Index, the West Country Exchange. Um, it can raise money, put a secondary market on it as well, which won't trade very often. It'll have to be a matched order basis. Put up your buys, put up your sales and see if they match. Yeah. You're never going to get a full trading market because it doesn't happen with smaller companies. never has, never will. No. Um, and, but it means it provides a mechanism for investors to be able to exit in due course. 
Um, so the cost isn't very big. The mechanisms and technology, frankly, is already there. Um, and the even, we well, believe, even the, uh, uh, the the compliance for it, the regulation for it, doesn't have to be that difficult, so long as you be suitably conservative about what it's for. Yeah. This is not for widows and orphans. So you actually, so it's not like crowdfunding. Let's let's stick a couple of hundred quid into that idea. No, that's a, that's a, that's a silly idea. And that's going to go wrong, as we'll see this year with some examples of crowdfunding failing. Um, no, you make it only for professional investors, i.e. those willing to sign the piece of paper saying, I'm barking mad, I'm willing to take the risk. <laughs> but family offices or pension mm. funds, or what it happens to be, or groups of angels. Um, and certainly in the West Country, there are all sorts of initiatives like that. And, of course, some which will be co-initiatives. Um, for instance, uh, there's the uh, Cornwall and the Owls of Silly Investment Fund which co-insists, co-invests with others. So there are all sorts of things. So this doesn't replace lots of ideas. In many ways, it actually pulls them all together, um, but starts creating the mechanism so that money can flow in the region, back into the region. Um, and of course, once promoted, and that uh, effectively that platform or index for that region is there, um, it's getting coverage elsewhere. And if it's successful, it will attract more companies. It will attract more money. And you can do that. I mean, we're also doing it in uh, in the Midlands and obviously in the Northwest. And the demand uh, is is certainly there, not because I say so, but because actually the companies need the money. The corporate advisors think it's a cracking good idea because they get to keep their businesses. And if you can find the right investors, and quite often those corporate advisors, um, if they've got a wealth management arm, often have the people themselves. It's just they don't talk to each other. Um, and so it can become a self-fulfilling promise. So, so this is right at the beginning. So I haven't made a noise about it yet because we're just starting. Yeah, okay. So Regionally is providing the plumbing for this then. So you said hmm. this platform's already existing, things like that. Are you sort of using... Uh, technology to provide this how exactly will it work if 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 i was a sort of prospective angel investor wanted to put some money yeah. uh, into a local company how will it work from my point of view well very straightforward what we've done is effectively set it up so that there is a this platform the regionally platform what we've done is effectively white labeled other people's ones because you don't need to reinvent all of this yeah. um and but just actually concentrate on the front end putting some dashboards there so that the investor can see what's going on the company raising money can see what's going on and so the court and corporate advisor nothing particularly wildly sophisticated in it um you know, stunningly obvious um but you get people to join the effectively you, you forward to join make it a form of club um, and so you get the people to join in with the platform, they have to pay to join. Um, and then in effect, what they get to see is what these businesses are that we're looking to try and do, what they want to try and raise money for, um, how they're doing it. And you give them lots of information in straightforward terms and the way that you and I are used to, such as actually using uh, videos and podcasts and things like that. Um, so people really get to hear, get to answer the questions they want to hear from people such as, what are you going to do with my money and what return am I going to get and am I going to get it back? And if so, when? Um, which often when you actually see these investment memoranda from companies coming through at the moment, you just sit there and you're never going to read that <laughs> because it's designed for you not to be able to actually get proper answers. So you can actually simplify it a lot. Um, in terms of taxation and EIS and SEIS and things like that, that's fine. It's, you just be completely, whatever tax wrapper can apply with it uh, can be used. Um, but me, keep it as simple as possible. So the first two companies got coming through. One is actually an Exeter, All right. um, and it's um, a, a finance company there, and uh, which is regional um, and uh, looking for regional investors as well. But basically, the company's got to a certain scale. They're looking to go on to the next scale. The sort of the gap, by the way, of the investment gap here is between about half a million and ten to fifteen million, right. because of uh, below half a million, individuals can help, angels can help. Sometimes a little bit higher than that, but not too much. Um, Above uh, or below 10 or 15 million, you don't find many institutions coming out of that. Private equity doesn't go down to that. Venture capital doesn't. Uh, they might on occasion, but they tend not to. So they're that yawning chasm. So that's the bit we're trying to focus on. So growing businesses from half a million to 10 to 15 million, in that particular case, the extra one's looking for about 10 to 15 million. Um, then there's the other one. It's actually a software business, um, and that's actually based in Bournemouth. Uh, that sort of counts as southwest if you look in the right direction. <laughs> um, and... Uh, the uh, and they're looking for much smaller sum of money. They're already operating and developing. This is just their growth stage, and it's actually very exciting. Um, and so, what what you're finding with that is then, of course, word goes round. Other people want to join in, 
And uh, so what I want to do is when that funding process ends for those two, and we can actually say, right, there's the platform, there's the Southwest, there are two companies on it. Not exactly, you can't actually put an index on that yet, no, but yet. it's a start. Um, and then you can prove it works. It's gone into the Bank of England and uh, it's gone into the Treasury and it's gone into number 10, all of whom said, oh, that's a good idea. Well, well they would. Uh, it doesn't cost them anything. Um, uh, but like a lot of these things, though, I don't want to talk about something which this is going to happen. It's a good idea, which is actually we've already done this and it's already working. Um, and then we can make some noise about it and not knock other people's shine off, but actually say work with those local regional funds and development ideas and this just is just another way of doing it but i say it's part of the plumbing mm. it's not replacing what they're doing fantastic it's exciting where would you like it to be five years from now say well i'd love it to be if we had say the main regions of of the united kingdom um if i can include scotland and that um and uh, and it's actually scotland's one of the problems because last year someone tried to set up a scottish stock exchange again and of course, it failed. Why? Because that's like in best, you know, starting a uh, reinventing a bicycle. You're using uh, all the old mechanisms of the stock exchange to try and do something which is dynamic today. So, you know, not hardly surprising that failed. But they'll still need something uh, in that area. So, what I would love to see in five years' time would be five or six regions, uh, each with their own. Uh, it's one platform, but a subset for a particular areas. So, marketed locally. I'd love to see maybe an index for the regional companies. I'd really love to see a regional index on that. And if you had a regional index for that, you could even have uh, a regional ETF, a fund based on that, yeah. uh, either on the index or the companies themselves. And that's how you would allow retail investors in at that stage for smaller scale items once you package it up into an item which is more understandable uh, and uh, is acceptable for the retail market. And if you could do that, then you'd actually have the regions blowing their trumpets saying, look what we can do here. This is how you get more money into somewhere like the Northeast, where there is no shortage of money. Um, uh, there, are, there are businesses there that need more capital. Um, but to the rest of the country, everyone else sits there and says, oh, it's the Northeast. It's not doing anything. Actually, it's the only area of the country that has more exports and imports. Actually, that's because of Nissan, but that's another reason. Um, but uh, you know, it is interesting when you everything else otherwise goes via London, and it's just very, very London centric with its costs. Um, and it's interesting when you tell people the sort of investment returns you get outside London are often higher than London. Why? Because you don't have to pay an extra one, two percent in costs every year of people leeching the money out of the system. You can actually do it at a much lower cost. And in days like this, with uh, interest rates so low. Those costs stick out like rocks through water. Mm. Fantastic. I, I just, uh, I'm sort of smiling to myself because I, I think it's, uh, I, I knew you would never <laughs> retire in the true sense of the word when the time, you know, came for you to um, uh, finish the, the, um, season uh, with 7am, which is sort of your life's work up to date. I knew you wouldn't sort of go gently off into the sunset and sort of do some oil painting on a beach or somewhere. I knew you'd... Uh, Hopefully not. Busy. I'm lousy at painting. <laughs> well, look, where can people find out more, Justin? Well, as a website, uh, and so if you look up regionally, uh, .co.uk, and uh, have a look at that. Um, and we're going to be making, hopefully, a little bit more noise about some of these companies coming through. Um, and if people want to come and sign and just, just sign up as a membership, we'll give them all the information they possibly have um, on uh, what's going on and how it's developing. And people want to join in, delighted if they, they do so. Not necessarily investing, but just with ideas and how it can mm -hmm. be developed. Um, and also, you see, it'll vary from region to region. Um, how they like to do different types of funding. Um, someone like Cornwall is actually you know, um, you know, very, dare I say, nationalistic. It, it likes looking after their own. Yeah. Fine, so be it. Mm -hmm. Someone like the West Midlands doesn't really matter in the slightest because it's much more uh, of, a, of a melange uh, of different types and styles of businesses. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to see which businesses come through first. So the fact that one's a finance business to start with based on property, okay, that sort of sort of makes sense. Software, that really does make sense. Um, and uh, so you can see a lot more technology businesses going through that route. And of course, a lot more in terms of the fashionable letters at the moment, ESG, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, environmental, social and governance, which is really important. Mm -hmm. I don't, don't want to be cynical over it. But we have to be careful because you know, we have uh, there'll be an awful lot of companies coming through with we are an ESG business. Maybe they're not quite as much as they thought they were. Remember, every single oil company is now no longer an oil company. 
Well, they're now an energy management business. Um, and they'll be telling you that they, of course, will be carbon neutral in, oh, I forget the date, and so are they. Um, but, you know, so it's, that, there's going to be a lot more in that world as well. But we need in Britain, though, is to focus on the area that knows something that we've discussed many times before, the fact we've set up so many small businesses in this country. Um, and there are a lot of failures. There always are in small businesses. We need to nurture those growth ones to the next stage. Um, and so all ideas welcome in terms of not just in regionally, but linking other areas and ideas into it, other local funding ideas um, to make sure they're getting properly highlighted and you know, making sure we're making the most of this because we need to, because Brexit, I'm afraid, you know, has put us back. It will make us poorer initially if we want to take advantage of it. And my view, I'm afraid, was, I'm afraid, very much anti it. But if we want to take advantage of where we are now, we're going to have to be imaginative over deploying capital to make us so productive. And how do you get productive? Not by turning more screws faster, but actually by using that technology and using the greater, greater investment. If government can do one thing, they can make sure that corporate investment, company investment, any size, is seen as a priority to make yourself productive. Uh, if you can do that, more people will be coming to you. And that's how you grow a successful business and a successful economy. Preach. I always love to hear you speak, Justin. And I'll obviously make sure there's links to regionally in uh, in the show notes. I wish you every success with it. I know that's that's a given. I'm, I'm certain about that. And it's great to see you so well and uh, enjoying this, this next phase of life. As ever, my friend, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Pete. It's been a great pleasure. So there you go. Fascinating insight into uh, what's going on with the world and also an exciting new venture, I think, in regionally, which really does have the potential to disrupt the status quo, make it easier for companies to find local funding. Obviously not for everybody listening to this, but for some people, I imagine it'll be of interest. So definitely check it out. There's a link to regionally in the show notes. My thanks again to Justin for his time and for his longstanding support of me and what I'm doing here. Uh, most of you won't know, actually, but he's always been a really vocal supporter of me and my planning firm, Jackson's Wealth, where me and my colleagues do things differently to a lot of the industry. He's always encouraged me with this sort of side project that's become a monster, Meaningful Money, including agreeing to financial support all the way back in early 2011. It was actually Justin that I called and asked if they would consider sponsoring the show. So without his and his co-founder, Tom Sheridan, without their willing agreement, I certainly could never have built this channel to what it is. Ten years they've been supporting you now. I'll always be grateful to them for that. Could not have done it without them. So thank you, Justin, and thank you, Tom, and all the team at 7am. And thank you to Justin for his time this week. Okay, this is called Where to Start by Phil R. 2013 from Canada. I generally thought I was pretty good with my finances. A little bit of a longer one, this, but worth it, I think. Uh, until I realized I was consistently owning, uh, owing money to credit cards, borrowing money from my savings on a promise to put it back one day. Then decided to buy a book to help me with my finances once and for all and found the Meaningful Money Handbook and, in turn, the Meaningful Money Podcast. This podcast is an absolute must for anyone wanting to secure their financial future. Within 10 months, I've cleared all my debt have a three-month emergency fund, have my pensions consolidated, have a decent amount invested in a managed multi-asset portfolio, and have some small amounts in satellite investments that I have on the site. Come on, that is progress. I've made my way through the back catalogue, listened to the episodes that I felt I needed to hear. I continue to listen every week and have encouraged a few friends to listen to. This stuff should be taught in schools. Thanks, Pete. I owe you a pint. Well, probably a whole pub, really. <laughs> a pint will do fine. Phil R. 2013, thank you so much for leaving that review and well done for taking radical action. Man alive. Ten months, that's a radical turnaround. So well done. Keep going. And uh, it's my pleasure to have been a small part in the inspiration for that. So if you like what you're hearing on the podcast or here on the YouTube channel, uh, trying to bang my hands on the desk again, uh, go to meaningfulmoney.tv slash love, meaningfulmoney.tv slash love, just like Phil R 2013 did. Wherever you're listening to me, uh, you can leave a review and a rating. It would really, really help. If you're watching on YouTube, hit like, hit subscribe. It all helps just push the channel up uh, to the top of the rankings and for more people to hear about it. So thank you in advance. Now, next time I'm going to be talking with a gentleman called George Egan. Now, George is a chartered financial planner, just like me. 
and he's launched uh, a new YouTube channel to get his message across. Uh, and he's good. He's good at YouTube, I tell you. And he's, uh, he's kind enough to say that I've influenced him in his uh, process of setting that up. Uh, I know Andy Hart of Maven Money. He's uh, been an influencer there as well. So George reached out to me and uh, just you know, basically to say thank you for uh, you know inspiring him and to show me what he was doing. And I just had to get him on because I'm excited for another fresh new voice in the world of personal finance creators. Uh, people sometimes sort of approach me and say, "Oh, you know, I don't want to step on your toes, and I'm not copying you." Um, and I'm always quick to say, "Look." the more people getting this information out to the world in different voices, different formats, uh, so, so important. So I'm super excited for George's channel and I know you're going to love it. So look forward to chatting with George next week, but that's it for this week's Meaningful Money podcast. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Justin Urquhart Stewart. My thanks to him once again. Questions, comments, go to meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 408. Links are there as well. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 408 hope you enjoyed it thanks for listening i'll talk to you next week cheers